Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Carter, making a video for the Climate Emergency Institute, so it is, of course, a climate change video. But this one is on war and climate change. I started uh, preparing it over the uh, Christmas and New Year season, the season, traditional season for uh, peace on Earth and goodwill to all men, which uh, I update to a deep peace on Earth and goodwill to all. So I can't put it off any longer um, because of uh, events which are getting worse, as you well know. And so uh, it's now January of 2024. An article published in The Guardian, uh, 9th of January, just recently, on the large global military emissions. And they're large enough to uh, constitute the amount of a uh, country uh, comparable to uh, emissions between India and uh, Russia. And so the um, article is a good one to read. It says the climate costs of war and militaries can no longer be ignored. And of course, the point is that that has been and is being ignored. And here's an article of June 2021 uh, from the Conflict and Environment Observatory saying we need to do more to understand the climate costs of war. And the image here is the uh, tragedy of uh, Aleppo in Syria. And it's hard to remember. This is back in 2013 now. A horrible, horrible um, wartime uh, tragedy. Now, uh, war and environmental destruction and pollution have long been linked. And when I say long, I mean thousands of years. Uh, today, we're more aware of... We're being made more aware of that than ever. An article here of March uh, 2022 from Chris Hedges in uh, which he headlines that endless war is back as the merchants of death waltz us towards Armageddon. He's referring to the doctrine of perma-war which dominated the world for 40 years. There seemed to be a respite but now this article says it's back. Big arms is big business and biz bigger and worse than ever. Uh, the permanent war economy never quit. I was made aware of the war economy um, uh, decades ago when I was involved in the uh, peace nuclear disarmament movement. And um, in our uh, lexicon now, there's the term forever wars. Um, which came from commentary on the, from the United States, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, etc. Here's a stunning example of the terrible toll on uh, nature of war, and this is Ukraine. And I took this image from uh, NASA firm's fire map in August of 2023, and you can see the uh, fire intensity um, by far and away the highest in Ukraine and in Ukraine, where the uh, front line, so to speak, the war was being waged. And so my point would be that for peace and a livable climate, we need to focus on the fossil fuel economy. Uh, fossil fuels fuel climate change, and they fuel war. And each one fuels the other and makes everything worse and worse and worse. Uh, so I'm looking at the twin tragedy, what I would call the twin tragedy of two insanities. One is waging war, and the other is changing the planet's climate. So as I say, um, I have some history of this, and I was uh, active in the IPPNW as a physician, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. They got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. And uh, they were focused on, and they did great work on the, uh, at that time, USSR, Soviet Union, USA, nuclear arms race, which was described as a policy of mutually assured destruction, appropriately called MAD. And that was very clearly, clearly insane. Back then, the nuclear warheads, the stockpiles, of the uh, basically the United States and the Soviet Union was 60,000 nuclear warheads and they were um, doing this cr insane competition of uh, building more and more and more, manufacturing more and more and more of them. 
So fortunately, there, um, uh, there was a big improvement of that. There was a, um, uh, a nuclear weapons treaty, the START treaty, that was actually signed by President Reagan and, and Gorbachev. Uh, but we haven't got rid of all the nuclear weapons. It's way less, but there's still a total of 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world. And again, United States and Russia have uh, most of them. But now, of course, we have China and we even have uh, India. And um, uh, that's way more than enough to um, uh, blow up the planet and, and uh, civilization. So I, I'm making this with, uh, with sincere respect for the lives and the families that are being shattered by war today. They're shattered materially, physically, and mentally. And that includes Ukrainians and Russians, and it includes Israelis and Palestinians. Um, uh, they are all part of our uh, human family. And I also include, obviously, the uh, war protesters, particularly those war protesters in the Russian Federation. updating myself on the news, the research on this, I'm making it out of um, a deep admiration for the um, all the aid agencies, humanitarian agencies, and that includes the uh, several United Nations aid departments that are working in Ukraine and also particularly in the Gaza situation right now, and of course the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, and the humanitarian NGOs. Now, it wasn't for these organizations. Um, things would be um, way, way, way worse. And so, um, to the uh, war in Gaza. So the latest news in the, on this is that they are now at a hundred days of uh, this war of death and suffering. The Israeli bombardment in the past hundred days has killed nearly 24,000 Palestinians, most are women and children, 60,000 people have been injured in Gaza, including 8,000, and now today I saw it reported as 10,000 children. Um, a lot of good people, of course, are working for a ceasefire, particularly the UN, but there is no indication of that happening at all. And there are still, according to reports, at least a hundred hostages being held in Gaza by uh, the Hamas forces. But of course, in the, the war in Ukraine is now 700 days. It's nearly two years of war in Ukraine. The United Nations has recently put out an appeal for $4.2 billion to provide humanitarian aid for the uh, people of Ukraine. Um, the reports are that nearly 1,800 children have been killed or injured since the escalation of the war, and that's according to UN verified reports. I've, I've taken some time to make sure that these numbers are verifiable. But of course, the UN says the true number is uh, going to be far higher. There are hundreds of thousands of children in Ukraine living in communities on the front lines of this terrible, horrible war who are terrified, traumatized, and deprived of their basic needs. Now, this is something that tends to be forgotten about in war. War causes deaths and horrible injuries, but also injury to the mental health, to the psychology of the individuals, particularly, of course, children who are so vulnerable to this. So the impacts of war, even when um, uh, peace is reached, goes on and on and on for years and years and years. And, of course, we know that homes, schools, and hospitals are being repeatedly hit by the uh, bombardments in Ukraine, and also water, gas, and power systems. Since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, more than 5.9 million Ukrainians have fled to other countries. They've been forced out of their homelands, which means that families have been split asunder. And um, uh, an awful, awful um, uh, human tragedy. This is a report from uh, Chatham House in the UK of March uh, 2023 on how Russia's war in Ukraine is threatening climate security. And of course, this is my main topic on the video. 
And I would summarize it by saying that war increases global heating emissions, directly and indirectly. The escalating world conflict, especially the really big, longest standing one, the Ukraine war, in the center of Europe. This is the largest obstruction for a cooperative international agreement to put global emissions into rapid decline, as was called for by the IPC6 assessment just a couple of years ago. But even more so, the bloody hot wars make it practically impossible to actually put an end to fossil fuels, which we have to do. The scientists and the IPCCs and all the organizations, of course, completely agreed on this. But um, uh, the situation, of course, is uh, very much the uh, reverse. Today's military armaments can only be manufactured by fossil fuel energy, and they're being manufactured more and faster than ever. Tanks and bombers um, can't be run on solar power. Now, this is from the World Economic Forum, its recent 11th of January this year. Every year they do a global risks survey. This one concludes that the world has become significantly less peaceful over the past decade, with conflict erupting in multiple regions last year. The situation with war, as I'm going to uh, explain, is actually worse than ever. There are 30 active conflicts are at the highest levels in decades, while related deaths have witnessed a steep increase, nearly quadrupling over the two-year period from 2020 to 2022 largely attributable to the war in Ukraine and in Ethiopia. And so this uh, is uh, statistics that reflect this. This is from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program of last year, the last year report, in which you see the incident and the impacts of state-based armed conflict uh, recorded from, nine, from 2007 up to 2022. And so you'll see that we're at conflicts uh, way up and increasing. There's 2020. And fatalities have just uh, soared over the past few years up to 240,000 now. So the, uh, the world is in a, a terrible, terrible, deeply tragic situation. Uh, here's uh, another um, illustration from the conflict data program. Uh, State-based armed conflicts by region, and here you see them going up. Africa, uh, most, um, Asia, and of course, continuing the Middle East. Um, same source, um, state-based armed conflict fatalities by region. And so you can see, look at the fatalities, the people uh, killed by the wars and conflict absolutely soaring over the past few years. But the leading, the worst um, uh, continent for this is uh, Africa. Uh, this is something that I, I've had for many, many, many years. Uh, this is one of my favorite artists, being a Brit. Um, this is by Sir Edwin Landseer, 1875. And, of course, these are engravings, the original oil paintings, uh, War and Peace. And, and why I'm showing them here, here is that there is a world of difference between war and peace. A world of difference. I think this is a great quotation. It's well known. It's from General Stonewall Jackson, 1861, Confederate General. Statement is, war is the sum of all evils. But the entire quote is even more relevant to today, in which he stated, It is painful enough to discover with what unconcern they speak of war and threaten it. They do not know its horrors. I have seen enough of it to make me look upon it as the sum of all evils. And obviously that's way more so today. And so that brings me right up to date with uh, Chris Hedges. He has a great uh, YouTube video in which he explains his latest book. It was republished uh, 26th of December of uh, last year, and the book called The Greatest Evil is War. Chris Hedges was a war correspondent for two decades in Central America, Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans, and many years with the New York Times. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, and he narrowly escaped death due to his assignments on a number of occasions. So here's a very well-known tradition in our culture of the appeal for no more war. 
This is from the Old Testament of the Christian Bible and, of course, the Jewish religion. And the uh, quote is, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So this is from the book of Isaiah. So we are going back thousands of years now. Uh, I've underlined the learn war. War, like uh, prejudice and racism, is is a learnt thing that happens uh, to people. It's a cultural disorder, disease, I would call it. And so I come to war and peace under climate change. Climate change is well known as the great threat multiplier, and it's a cause conflict. And war is a driver of climate change. And as I mentioned already, fossil fuels fuel climate change and fuel war. And we are uh, making, we are extracting more and more fossil fuels and burning more and more fossil fuels than ever. The emissions continuing to soar. So we're talking about war in, certainly in my generation, of course the big one is the Vietnam War, 1954 to 75, my God, millions were killed. And it shows how much a failure, an absolute abject failure, war is in every way. This enormous human cost, estimates of the number of Vietnamese soldiers and civilians killed range up to 3 million. 58,000 U.S. service members also died in this conflict. Today, Vietnam is a unified country since 1975. It is a one-party communist state and has been one of the Southeast Asia's fastest growing economies. So you can see how much a abject failure war is in every way. Uh, climate change mitigation then is unlikely without international peace, a situation of no war, a situation in which war has been abandoned and abolished. In 1992, the Earth Summit Rio Declaration had this in, in one of their principles. Peace development and environmental protection are interdependent and indivisible. We conclude that positive peace is more conducive to accommodating environmental considerations and the plurality of conditions on which countries achieve and maintain peace and sustainability. Uh, we, of course, have made uh, no progress towards this. We are going rapidly in the wrong reverse direction. Uh, which makes it even more useful to uh, look back on it and remember it. Um, so to bring us up to date with the UN, November of 2023, the situation is one quarter of humanity, two billion people, are living in conflict areas today, and the world is facing the highest number of violent conflicts since the end of World War II, 1945. The highest number of conflicts today. And um, uh, Secretary Guterres at the United Nations Peace Building Commission, which is associated with the Sustainable Development Goals Conference, uh, noted that last year, 84 million people forced to leave their homes because of conflict, violence, and human rights violations. And that doesn't even include the Ukraine war, which has already seen 4 million people flee the country and displace another 6.5 million people within the country, according to the UN. So due to war and conflict, at least 274 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. And that's a 17% increase. So we are in a terrible, terrible emergency situation from climate disruption, of course, but also from war. And as I say, they feed into each other. We are looking at staggering, staggering numbers of people suffering, disabled, uh, many of them uh, disordered disabilities for life, physically as well as emotionally. And so we had this Global Sustainable Development Report last year, 2023, and again, highest level of state-based conflict since 1945. By the end of 2022, billion people living in conflict-affected countries. 2021, the number of refugees and internally displaced persons were the highest on record, 89 million. Military expenditure 
had reached a new record exceeding $2 trillion a year. And so you see this from the Sustainable Development Report, state-based armed conflicts and uh, huge increase over the uh, past uh, 10 years or so. And here's the world military expenditure, which is done every year by the Stockholm International Peace and Research Institute. And uh, so this starts from 1990, going up, up, up. And over the past, as I say, uh, recent years, increasing fast to reach its absolutely insane level of over $2 trillion a year. And so this is a report from the Transnational Institute, November 2022, entitled Climate Collateral, How Military Spending Accelerates Climate Breakdown. And so this, of course, is the big point I'm uh, trying to make here and presenting the evidence for this situation. So here's world military expenditures, 2022, the highest countries, of course, most know the United States is by far the top, $877 billion a year now. Uh, next is China at $292 billion a year, and Russia, $866 billion a year. Uh, the United States military is going up and up and up. Here's another one that's similar, but it's showing military expenditure as a percentage of the GDP. And there we find, in actual fact, the United States is not is by far not the top country. Top country is Ukraine. Thirty-four percent of their GDP is being spent on war, even with all the um, uh, donations, etc., that they're receiving. Next is Saudi Arabia, and the United States comes way down after Israel, Russia, Greece. United States, the absurd, obscene amount of uh, over $800 billion is actually 3.5% of their GDP. So then I, I turn from the same report to the crushing military expenditures of poor countries, uh, many of them in Africa. And for example, um, a poor country, Burkina Faso, uh, spends over 3% of its GDP on armaments, and the same in Burundi and other countries. So this is um, this war militarized situation is universal. It's affecting the poorest countries, and it is being pursued by the richest of countries. So here are the military expenditures from the World Bank from 1977 up to 2022. So just look at this. I mean, this is absolutely insanely obscene. So this is a world at war. I'm going to come to this, um, uh, the permanent war economy. This is another example of world military expenditures. This is, um, this is from a yearbook database. But I put it here because you can see from 1950 up to 2020. So here's the military expenditures from the U.S., USA, continually increasing, now of $800 billion. Um, this was the expenditure during the nuclear arms race of the Soviet Union. The Russian Federation, it's way down, and China is the big, rapidly increasing uh, country with the expenditure on armaments. And so we are in a hostile world, a armed camp, um, bristling with more and more and worse and worse weapons. Um, this is not any way to achieve peace. It can only generate more conflict, more paranoia, more war. This is a, a good map to look at. This is from the crisis group. Um, this is a year ago, global zones of conflict. And look how many there are. Ukraine, of course, China and Taiwan, Iran, of course, also Pakistan, and of course now Gaza, Israel but also Yemen and Ethiopia and the Sahel and um, a conflict zone in the uh, Congo in Central Africa. So there's Ukraine. U Ukraine is, is this huge country, the um, largest country of Europe, and it's in the middle of the extended geographic Europe. It's a huge country. And here we are, Israel. There's Egypt, Jordan. So this is Israel and this is Gaza that little strip of red there. And this you'll have heard about, this is the West Bank. 
And so there is conflict going on continually with Israeli forces, military forces in the West Bank and the refugee camps and, of course, in Gaza. Another horrifying record statistic of increasing global conflict from 2008 to 2023 brings us right up to date. So here we are, and the conflict is just increasing, 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 and right now faster than ever. Um, So there's an overall trend and a year-on-year percentage change which uh, continues from 2008 right up to this year, 2023. And this is, this is their global peace index, so it's a very good expression of it, in which they say peacefulness has declined year on year for 13 of the last 15 years. So this is a less secure, a less peaceful um, world, a world in higher conflict, higher uh, violence. And of course there's increased force displacement as a result of wars. And here we have families wrecked and people ruined. And this is showing the sorry, tragic state of affairs there from 2007 to 2022. So these are refugees continuing to increase and these are internally displaced people. So look at this huge increase on uh, poor families torn apart and people are forced out of their homes um, because of wars. Now, um, yeah, I mean, the situation in in Gaza is uh, being recorded, and I'll get to this in a minute, as uh, among the worst invasions and death and destruction. But the worst war of recent years is, was Tigray, and there were over 500,000 deaths in just two years. So we're looking again at Ethiopia and the Middle East here, and there's Sudan, and um, there's, the, um, uh, there's the Red Sea, which we're hearing a lot about, and there's Somalia. So here is Tigray, 500,000 people killed, 500,000 people killed in this absolutely horrendous war over two years. It was, uh, it's a familiar story, it was between rebels, Tigrayan rebels and Ethiopian troops, and the reports were just absolutely horrendous. And so the Ukraine war. So uh, where are we with the Ukraine war? So um, civilian deaths in the Ukraine war um, now top 10,000. And this is 21 months of war, and the um, deaths are, are unquestionably will be more than that. Um, uh, displaced people as of uh, October of last year, 6.2 million refugees from Ukraine have been recorded. And most of them, as I say, families split apart, torn asunder, a ruinous situation. At least 100,000 civilians, including more than 560 children, have been killed in the Ukraine war, and over 18,500 have been injured. Uh, This is since February of 2022, which is just a couple of years. Look at the death and destruction, and this is from the United Nations Human Rights um, Mission. The United States estimates this huge number of uh, Russian and Ukrainian military casualties. Now, um, I've checked up on this, and this is exaggerated. However, Ukrainian casualties have reached 130,000 soldiers, and uh, this includes uh, 17,500 Ukrainian troops killed. Russia's military casualties, they say, is approaching 300,000. Um, and maybe 120,000 killed in action. Well, the the message here is that tens, many tens of thousands of uh, forces, military forces in on Ukraine and the Russian Federation have already been killed. And the mayhem is um, continuing, and from all reports, it's actually worse than ever. The civilian casualties in Ukraine, which have been terrible, terrible, Um, during the uh, Russian invasion. And these are verified by the UN. So we have civilian deaths, 9,600. 554 of those are children. Um, These are deaths. Uh, Wounded civilians, 17,500. 
17,500 and more. And wounded children are 1,180. And of course, again, the United Nations said that these are verified numbers. The actual numbers are going to be higher. They're going to be worse. Uh, so, as I've mentioned already, 30 million people have been forced out of their homes in Ukraine by the Russian invasion. And this is a report on that from the UN and where those people have fled to. Uh, the, the weaponry, uh, the armaments, the um, shelling um, in this war is just unbelievable. America is sending so many arms to Ukraine, this is from November of last year, that it's putting major pressure on the Pentagon's weapons stockpile. And uh, that's from the Associated Press. Um, Ukraine, um, last year another report, is firing shells faster than they can be supplied. Now these are these big, huge shells that we're talking about here. So the report is that Ukrainian guns were firing 6,000 rounds daily and the military wants to shoot more than 10,000 a day. And that is a fraction of the 60,000 shells that Russia was blasting off at the peak of the 2023 um, last year barrage. This is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, this is um, complete, absolute evil insanity. Uh, again, you've got to think that is an exaggeration. However, uh, consider this. Uh, this is a statement from the Pentagon published uh, October 2023, in which uh, the Pentagon uh, spokesperson said that the United States goal is to produce these shells at a pace of 100,000 rounds a month, compared to 28,000 rounds a month at present and that's doubled to 14,000 rounds per month after Russia invaded Ukraine in February last year that the United States was providing the Ukraine forces with. So we are looking at a staggering amount of uh, these uh, huge shells. And we have a return of trench warfare, World War I trench warfare of the Ukrainian military and Russian military and the shelling and the bombardments going on continually. And, uh, you know, just to underline that, here's a uh, Ukrainian town. Um, this is uh, Marinka. Absolute, complete devastation. And so again, I'm referring to the Chatham House report. Russia's war on Ukraine is threatening climate security as well. And so we move on to the latest um, horror, the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Now, um, this record of the conflict puts it in a broader perspective because this runs from 2008 up to December of 2023. And so we have uh, civilians and uh, military killed, um, uh, Palestine, Gaza, and also uh, Israel. But of course, now we have this absolutely unbelievable increase in, uh, in fatalities. But um, in 2014, there was a similar kind of situation, um, although it never got to the level that it's got to now. So this is not new. And actually, um, the conflict between um, uh, Israelis and Palestinians does indeed go back thousands of years. It's in the um, Old Testament of the Bible. And as I alluded to, the Israel attack, the invasion on Gaza, is being described as the most destructive in recent history. Now, I'll start with the Israeli, uh, the Israeli casualty killed. Um, this was on the 15th of December last year, and the final death toll from the Hamas attack is put at 695 Israeli civilians, 695, including 36 children, uh, 373 Israel security forces, and then at that time there were 250 hostages, and 19 hostages had already 
um, uh, being killed. And you'll remember this absolutely horrible, atrocious um, attack on the rave party that uh, Hamas is, um, the assault of Hamas was on. And um, they now got that um, record of 364 people killed. This was a rave. Um, this was young people. Many of them actually Israeli peace activists. It was a military operation on these people and on their uh, couldn't be more peaceful gathering. And so the situation at present uh, on Gaza, the number of Gaza residents reported killed in this uh, war, this invasion, is now over 20,000. Most are women and children. It has surpassed the toll for any other Arab-Israeli conflict in more than 40 years, and the conflict has been going on for decades. Uh, most experts say this figure, again, is most likely an undercount. Israel has dropped more than 25,000 tons of explosives on the Gaza Strip since October the 7th, and that's equivalent to two nuclear bombs. At present, there is a hunger crisis of 93% of the people. The World Health Organization has said that northern Gaza has been left without any functional hospital uh, due to the bombing, of course, and also lack of fuel and staff and supplies. And the WHO says that only nine out of the 36 health facilities in the whole of Gaza are remaining partially functional. Uh, so again, I want to uh, remind us that the world is witnessing the largest number of violent conflicts since 1946. One quarter of the global population now living in conflict-affected areas. A hundred million people displaced from their homes. Uh, the, the, the worse the war gets, the worse the violent gets, the worse, the more we have to focus and think peace and believe in peace and work towards peace. And it seems to me we're going in the other direction this time. So from uh, General Eisenhower, the hope of the world is that wisdom can arrest conflict between brothers. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies a theft from those who hunger and not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers and the hopes of its children. And I'll take a pause on the hopes of its children. So, what I'm saying here is in this age of global climate catastrophe, carbon spewing devastating war, we have to end that or it is going to be the end of us all. Because we are in this um, destructive insane spiral uh, fueled by a fossil fuel industry of war and also climate disruption and they both feed into each other making each other worse and worse. Um, I sort of started in a way um, with this article from the New York Times of the 23rd of October 2023 and the title is How the Israel Hamas War Imperils Action Against Global Warming. And of course it is. Now, the IPCC in its last sixth assessment just a couple of years ago stated over and over that to avoid a climate catastrophe of 2 degrees C and also 1.5 degrees C, emissions had to be put into decline on an immediate, rapid basis. So the future of everyone is being destroyed and devastated by this situation today. So here's a meeting of the G7 leaders. Um, they have these economic meetings um, uh, and they never come to any constructive agreement on world peace, on uh, war, disarmament, or on uh, climate change and climate disruption. They make all kinds of promises, but uh, nothing ever happens or never happens so far.
This is a report, the text, from the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. They are a collection of NGOs and activists who are the real leaders of the world on climate disruption. On the 21st of May, 2023, Hiroshima, Japan, G7 governments who claim to be climate leaders have today framed public investment in fossil fuels, that's uh, investment paid by our taxes, paid by us, as appropriate and have called for expansion of an industry that is the primary cause of not only the climate crisis, but multiple conflicts and wars over recent decades. The final leaders' communique of the G8, that is, included final texts such as, quote, we stress the important role that increased deliveries of LNG can play and acknowledge that investment in the sector can be appropriate. LNG is liquefied natural gas. Natural gas is a fossil fuel that emits CO2 when it's burnt for energy, and it's also a major and increasing source of methane because it is mainly methane, and uh, the industry and the distribution, um, of course, results in methane leaks. LNG is a liquefied natural gas, and with respect to energy and greenhouse gas emissions, that's worse than the plain natural gas. The comment, of course, is these statements fly in the face of the latest science and undermine any credibility these seven government nations hold as climate leaders. Fossil fuels are the substances responsible for 86% of CO2 emissions in the last decade, fueling the climate crisis, but also fueling a series of conflicts across the world which we have seen are rapidly increasing. Claiming to be climate leaders, they are doing just the opposite, subsidizing the fossil fuel industry to the tune of trillions of dollars a year now. We're up to like $7 trillion a year, according to the IMF. This is an evil criminal insanity that uh, the world's leading governments are carrying out. So I want to point out, as I finish, there's no future for us, as the IPCC says, no livable future. The six assessments said that we now have to secure a livable future, and there isn't one without ending the fossil fuel industry, replacing all fossil fuels, as we know for years and years and years, 100% with clean renewable, which is everlasting energy. So here we have our leaders and industry, corporations, armaments industry, fossil fuel industry, creating the worst of imaginable futures when we still have, hopefully in our grasp, the best of all possible futures by getting off fossil fuels and onto the clean renewable energy.